Good morning on this wonderful sunny Labor Day weekend. My name is Marcia Stevenson and I'm Vice President of your Board of Trustees. Welcome to the North Shore Unitarian Church, where our mission is to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. What I love about this community is our openness to celebrating the beauty of nature and hope for the world as we face challenges both personal and global. Welcome especially to anyone who is visiting us today. Wherever you are in your journey and however you name what is sacred, there is room for you here. Good morning. Unitarians are often referred to as God's frozen people. And it's true, we can't get lost in our heads. We pride ourselves on being rational. And many of us apply logic to understanding theological issues. We look at sacred texts as 2,000 year old books written by authors who did not have the benefit of modern science and understanding. The earth is demonstrably more than 6,000 years old and contemplating creation is enhanced by an understanding of galaxies, relativity, quantum mechanics, and evolution, maybe even string theory. Does this rational approach mean that we are uninspired, non-spiritual, devoid of awe, and no fun? This morning I'd like to offer a viewpoint that being rational and scientific can actually enhance one's sense of awe, and that we should not only be proud of being Unitarians, but also should be passionate and ecstatic. I would also like to express this enthusiasm with an attempt to borrow some of the style of charismatic preachers. But rather than occasionally, an occasional, can I get an amen, I will from time to time exclaim, now ain't that good news, <laughs> in hopes that you will respond with an enthusiastic good news. So to get into the spirit, let's practice. Now ain't that good news? Good news. Now ain't that good news? Good news. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's get started with what I call atheist awe. Technically, I'm an agnostic rather than an atheist. Richard Dawkins states that all atheists are technically agnostics because we can't possibly be sure. I like Woody Allen's version. There's no way to prove there is no God. You just have to take it on faith. <laughs> I refer to myself as an atheist because it seems highly unlikely to me that there is a supreme being. So I don't experience the awe of being loved by God or guided or part of a supreme being's plan. When something goes wrong, I attribute it to random chance or bad luck. I don't pray for good things. I just hope that I'll be one of the lucky ones. So far, I have been. Now ain't that good news? When I look at the amazing complexity in occurrences in nature, I experience awe. But I don't attribute them to God's design. I attribute them to the interaction of random chance and evolutionary forces. That something as simple as survival of the fittest and random variation could create monarch butter butterflies which migrate between Mexico and northern Canada over multiple insect generations is beyond astonishing to me. Many other examples in nature are awesomely beautiful, coincidental, complex, or just plain amazing. Astronomy is another source of awe and inspiration. The unfathomable vastness of the distances the millions and millions of stars in each of the millions and millions of galaxies. The discovery of black matter, which was discovered by Vera Rubin, who observed that the rotation of stars within distant galaxies violated Newton's laws. Vera Rubin died last Christmas day without receiving a Nobel Prize for this seminal discovery. 
I am awed by Einstein's mental explorations, which led to the theory of special relativity more than a century ago. Schrodinger's cat, the failure to find any signs of life elsewhere in the universe despite the overwhelming odds in favor. Our fascination with the solar eclipse, all of these inspire in me a reverence and appreciation. Now ain't that good news? That such discoveries could come from a species which continues to wage war, exploit, discriminate against, and ignore the poverty of their fellow beings, as well as the obvious conclusions about the dangers of CO2 emissions, is amazing in its own perverse way. But it's not good news. The late Reverend Forrest Church of All Souls UU in New York City mused about the marvel of his birth at the end of a multi-million year uninterrupted, uninterrupted sequence of successful births and parentings. I have been known to brag about the fact that all of my ancestors, every one of them, live long enough to have children of their own. Of <laughs> Good news. Of all the billions of sperm, the ones that led to me somehow won the competition. Now, ain't that good news? <laughs> then there is the awe of human interaction, a baby's smile or laugh, hearing a great or just catchy piece of music, viewing a painting, getting a joke, crying at a true or fictitious story, reaching an agreement, Enjoying these interactions apparently increases our survival chances because we, successful products of a long evolution, enjoy them. Now, ain't that good news? In what sense are these moments of awe spiritual? They seem spiritual to me in two ways. First, they grab me and pull me into the now. And second, they remind me that I am part of something greater than myself greater than my preoccupations, frustrations, and strivings. Part of something wonderful. I may not, it may not seem like a religious experience to some, to some, but it does to me. While there are several reasons to be proud of being a Unitarian or a Universalist or a UU, the name does lack emotional or marketing appeal. Unitarians go back a long way, but it's a complicated story to describe. It's not an accident that we've ended up with a hyphenated label, and it's not easy to explain what Unitarian means or what Universalist means or what relevance these terms have today. In 325 of the Common Era, the Nicene Creed codified the doctrine of the Trinity, where the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are all different aspects of God. The term Unitarian refers to opposition to this doctrine of the Trinity. Universalism is a later manifestation of the view that all will be saved, not just the elect or true believers. The underlying characteristic of Unitarians through the ages is that they reject the hardline orthodoxy of the day. They are heretics. Personally, I think calling ourselves the Church of Heresy would be more descriptive and no harder to explain than Unitarian or Universalist. We are a group who figures out our own truth and chooses our own conclusions regardless of the current orthodoxy. A week ago in the Vancouver Sun, Douglas Todd quoted Farhan Shah, a moderate Muslim, who said, quote, by shutting down our faculties of critical reason, we tend to bolster patriarchal, anti-humanistic, and repressive ideas. As the song we just sang in four different styles, even to question truly is an answer. Maybe we should be called the unorthodox church, or the iconoclasts, or the rationalists, or the questioners, or the thinkers. Now ain't that good news? A common consequence of passion is the desire to tell others about it. People frequently remark that Unitarians don't evangelize or proselytize. And my response is, sure we do. 
but only about movies, books, and restaurants. <laughs> Anytime you hear a you, you, other the phrase, you just gotta, there's probably a movie, a book, or a restaurant involved. Our fear of being annoying, in our fear of being annoying, we keep our enthusiasm for this religious community a secret. In a cynical world, it's not cool to be too enthusiastic. Well, I'm here today to say that I'm a Unitarian, and I'm glad I am, and I'm proud of it. Yes, I am proud. Yes, I am. Now, ain't that good news? <laughs> Whatever you call us, we're pretty amazing. We have a long record of being on the right side of history, from fighting slavery to supporting women's suffrage to marching for civil rights and supporting same-sex marriage. Now, ain't that good news? Lower mainland Unitarians supported U.S. war resistors during the Vietnam War and have been at the forefront of the environmental movement going back to the founding of SPEC and Greenpeace. It's an enviable record. And our recent involvement in the anti-tanker, anti-pipeline movement, and there's a rally next Saturday, has taken us a big step higher in this aspect of our community. Now, ain't that good news? Are there orthodoxies today that cry out for a dose of Unitarian heresy? Is the denial of climate science the orthodoxy? If you look at the paucity of government policies to reduce emissions of CO2, you would have to say so. Apart from stating some reduction goals, 17% by 2020, 30% by 2030, practically nothing has been done. Two leaders of the climate change movement, James Hansen and Bill McKibben, spoke at the Vancouver Institute lecture at UBC in the recent years, and Unitarians were well represented in the audience. Now, ain't that good news? In an article published in 2012 in Rolling Stone, Bill McKibben presents global warming's terrifying new math. There are three numbers to note. First, two degrees is the maximum safe increase in the average temperature on Earth. We're not quite to one yet, and we, we're seeing some pretty awful things. The second number, 565 gigatons, is the maximum remaining emissions of CO2 that will keep us within the two degree limit. And the third number, 2,800 gigatons versus 565, is the amount of CO2 emissions in our proven reserves of coal, oil, and gas, natural gas. This means that to keep global warming within safe, although not comfortable limits, we have to leave 80% of our proven reserves of fossil fuels worth $20 trillion in the ground. Talk about a challenge for political will. Note that the Alberta tar sand, or oil sands account for about 240 gigatons of the 565 total. The Prime Minister's recent statement that, or misstatement about phasing out the oil sands may have been a case of the truth leaking out. And now we face feedbacks where climate change causes even more CO2 emissions. In 2014, wildfires, wildfires in BC accounted for 67 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions, more than all other sectors, transport, buildings, industry, waste, and agriculture combined. We don't yet have the figures for 2017. This type of analysis appeals to our Unitarian rationalism, and we seek good analyses on different topics. One of my recent discoveries is a new book by Chelsea Vowell called Indigenous Rights. It's W-R-I-T-E-S. It's just out. And yes, I'm proselytizing about a book. Ask me about movies and restaurants after the service. <laughs> Chelsea writes rationally, sensibly, engagingly, and challengingly about many of today's indigenous issues. Chelsea Val is someone we often about whom we often say is a Unitarian but doesn't know it. We use this term frequently, and I think it's one of our highest compliments. We say it about someone who is questioning, critical, and rational, while also being caring and compassionate. 
I think it says a lot about us that we view this as high praise. Now, ain't that good news? Another modern orthodoxy is free market capitalism and the invisible hand. Western economic and social development has been the result of a balanced economy with a big, expensive, and important role for government. A low tax ideology has resulted in growing deficits, deteriorating infrastructure and social services, and a major increase in income equality. Jeffrey Sachs, reporting on the US in a recent book, that the chronic deficit in the US, currently 6% of GDP, closely matches the increase in the share of after-tax income taken by the top 1%. The top 1% share after income tax has gone from 3.3% of GDP in 1970 to 10% today. During that period, middle class earners in both the US and Canada have not had any increase in after-tax income after correcting for inflation. Such a situation could lead to poor voter choices. That ain't good news, but a successful heresy against these orthodoxies would be. So this could lead to poor voter choices. And speaking of Trump, <laughs> alternate facts are a major threat to rational discourse. Unitarians in all countries are being called upon to recognize and resist populist demagogues, leaders who claim to speak for the people and who distort and undermine the truth are a major threat to democracy. It is serious, but it can also be fun. The Dallas Stars hockey team played the Washington Capitals the night after the January inauguration. The arena in Dallas, which has a capacity of 20,000, announced the night's attendance on the jumbotron screen, screen as 1.5 million. <laughs> Everyone got the joke. <laughs> Besides our distinguished role in history and our emerging role in the surrounding community, we have a wonderful community here at North Shore. Our principles and purposes serve as a natural selection mechanism that attracts a collection of interesting and wonderful people. As you are all evidence of this, I rest my case. Now, ain't that good news? <laughs> Furthermore, our community encourages non-superficial friendships. My definition of a friend is someone who will tell me when I'm making a mistake or just being a jerk. I have to say that I have many friends by this definition, <laughs> and sometimes I'm glad for that. And we have wonderful, young, energetic co-ministers. Now, ain't that good news? Yes. I would like to close with two Unitarian quotes. What makes me a Unitarian Universalist minister, what makes this church and this religion my home, is that, long, that it long ago stopped asking its members, do you have the ability to believe in God, and instead turned its passion and purpose to the question, do you have the ability to listen to your life and notice when it lights up? Go do more than you've ever done. Go trust life more than you've ever had to before. Go put yourself in someone's hands and risk being hurt again. Go follow a new path for which you have no roadmap. Go and give, yourself in, give of yourself in ways that will leave you vulnerable. Go and let yourself care about and invest yourself in something that may, fall, that may fail or break your heart. As you passionately do these things, you can also use your dispassionate analysis. There's no conflict. Ain't that good news? Thank you.